Good morning. Today begins a new series of sermons under the title, To Bless the Space Between Us, which takes its title from a book of blessings by John O'Donohue, an Irish priest, poet, theologian, and philosopher. If you are unfamiliar with John O'Donohue, I could not commend his work to you more highly. Though he died an untimely death in 2008, at 54, he embodied in every way the modern Celtic mystic. He sought and found beauty in all things. To have his word and spirit guide us in any way is a gift. I'd like to point you to one of his final interviews before he died. It's a conversation with Krista Tippett on her radio program On Being. It is one of the most delightful and meaningful hours you will ever spend. A couple of years ago, I sent the link of the interview to my beloved brother, who does not spend much time on spiritual matters, and he texted back to me after listening, in all caps, wow, period, wow, period, wow, period. In the wonderfully surprising way of the Holy Spirit, it is fitting that we should begin this series today because the underlying concern and theme of O'Donohue's last work, which was published posthumously, was thresholds. That tremulous in-between space, between worlds, between choices, between reality and dreams, between loving and knowing, between who we are and who we are becoming. Today's lectionary brings us into the ultimate threshold space, the place between standing and sending, believing and unbelieving, between life and death, grief and joy, blindness and seeing, and life and life transformed. In keeping with today's passage, O'Donohue is dedicated to, explore, to exploring how the visible and the invisible the material and the spiritual intertwine in human experience. And so we come to our passage today from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, 19 through 31. Hear now the word of the Lord given for us this day. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors were locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins, sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen, yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the dedication of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, 
our rock and our redeemer. Amen. There is a lot going on here, some that might seem familiar. Remember, it was Mary who, weeping, meets Jesus in the garden, first mistaking him for the gardener. Jesus sends her back to the disciples to tell them she has seen the Lord. They go to see for themselves and only find the linen wrappings. So we find ourselves in the upper room waiting. And here we encounter Thomas again. Poor Thomas, he has become the doppelganger for all our doubt and questions. If Thomas needed proof, and he was right there, then maybe my skepticism, that little gnawing worry that it might not be true, isn't so bad. In his gospel, John has anticipated this feeling, and so given us this version to help us along. And our faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, Imagine for a minute what is happening here. Jesus, their leader, and as best as they can understand it, their Messiah has led them around for a few years, preaching and teaching far from their homes and their families and their lives. They have molded molded themselves into this new kind of community at his behest, and they're beginning to get it loving unconditionally, sharing all things, carrying nothing, sitting and caring with the poorest, the most marginalized, the most reviled. It must have been in some way electrifying. They must have had some glimmer of a thought that like, the Messiah has chosen me? Me? Me from nowhere with nothing to offer? Is at the center of everything? In the Holy Week we recently celebrated, very quickly, things get very dark. Jesus said they would a number of times, but they didn't want to hear it or couldn't, didn't have the imagination. And then the cross, the horrifying, gut-wrenching brutality of it, the blood, the gore, the shame, the jaws of power clenching down with no way to stop the fiending crowds, not to mention the guilt they all felt, scattered like rats on a sinking ship. Saturday in that upper room must have been so intense, sad beyond anything, traumatic, confusing, the grief, sorrow, disbelief, and despair, the occasional wailing and sobbing of someone off in the corner. Into this scene, Mary bursts in, saying she has seen him. The others run and see he's gone, and they come back, and they only have Mary's word to go on. And then, boom, he's in the room. He's right there, not a ghost, a body, but transformed. Can you imagine what that must have felt like? My mother died when I was 20. It would be like if she walked into the back of this sanctuary and waved and blew me a kiss. If that were to happen, I think I would spontaneously combust. (laughs) I'm sure you all have someone you've lost, you've loved more than life itself, who would make you collapse if you turned right now and they were sitting right next to you. Well, this happened to these men and women. And we were talking about the Messiah, the Son of God, whose appearance to these people is now going to change everything forever. And in that moment, Jesus says, what happened to me is going to happen to you. As I am, you will be. As the Father sent me, I am sending you. Jesus is not wishing them peace. Peace, shalom, has arrived. Thomas has been somewhere we don't know. Maybe he just needed some space. Or maybe he was next on on the list to gather food. Or perhaps he wanted to gather some intelligence about those religious leaders they're all so scared of. Remember, Thomas has courage. 
he questions Jesus, and he's one of the few named disciples. In John 11, all the other disciples don't want Jesus to go to Lazarus because he's already dead and it's dangerous. But Thomas says in verse 16, let us go that we may die with him. And later, Thomas in chapter 14 elicits from Jesus the most important thing Jesus says in all the Gospels. Jesus is trying to explain what will happen to him, and he says in verse 3, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. So all this is behind Thomas when he is told that Jesus has come. But Thomas missed Jesus, and with, I think, some very reasonable skepticism, says, show me. As with my mother, if, she, if you told me she was waiting out there for me, I wouldn't believe you as much as I wanted to. And remember, emotions are heightened, and he probably thinks they've all gone mad. Here's something I never noticed. Jesus comes back a week later, and he seems to know what Thomas has said to them. We don't know what happened in that week. Maybe they were having meetings or forming committees, hoping Thomas will come around. But Jesus appears again, and he offers Thomas his wounds. Jesus seems unfazed. If that's what Thomas needs, that's what I will give him. And Thomas, amazed and astounded, no longer needs to touch him and sputters out the last words in faith, the highest form of Christological identity we can name, my Lord and my God. One. As Calvin said, faith has its own sight. God and Son are one, just like he said to Thomas earlier, And don't forget that Jesus breathes on them this new breath of life, God, Son, and Spirit. If we really begin to imagine what happened, it takes our own breath away. So once past the doubt, try to imagine the joy, the elation, the glory that has befallen them. That's for us too. It's what I tried to tell the kids last week. All this Easter beauty and celebration, it's pointing to the joy and elation that is offered us when Jesus dies by torture and then walks through the doors to breathe new life back into the cosmos. The word for breath in this passage is only used here in the entire New Testament. It is meant to be reminiscent of God's breath, the creation in Genesis, when he breathes life into Adam, and in Ezekiel, when, he breathe, when breath reanimates the dry bones. Connections early Jewish hearers of the gospel would have easily recognized. The disciples and us are the new Adams, breathed to life by the life, death, and resurrection of what Thomas now knows is his Lord and God. O'Donohue writes, For life itself is the primal sacrament, namely the invisible sign of invisible grace. In each of us is that spirit of life, the face of God, with sin and death now conquered on the cross. So what now? How shall we live? How shall we know that it is true? If we ever doubt, Jesus will show us again that he is risen. As it says in 1 Peter, although you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy. 
For you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So how do we live in this threshold? Thresholds cross us into the unknown and invite us into what O'Donohue calls the shorelines of new worlds. Because he has come. And by believing, we have been given life in his name. But we also know that peace is not complete. That's confusing. If all is conquered and complete, why is there still so much that feels so wrong and so brutal and so sad? I can only say this. The principalities and powers that Jesus and Paul keep referring to They will not give up easily. They will be vanquished. They already are. They are just in their death throes. Jesus gives us the way. He sends us as he was sent. Easter is the beginning of our mission. That mission is to love our neighbors, forgive our enemies, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your might. And we will bring it about. That is how we reveal God to the world, at least in part. That is what on Easter Day feels so possible. But Easter doesn't end. And now in these final days, which could be tomorrow or a million years from now, Our time is not God's time. We are called to live in this in-between time as Easter people. People who love and serve with joy. It's a story of hope and promise. Jesus' grace and patience will come without limit or measure and without judgment or shame. As Paul says, we are a new creation. Jesus has reconciled us to God, and we are ambassadors for Christ. God is making his appeal through us. By our faith, others will come to know who God is. We overcome our doubt and believe, trusting beyond all reason in the one who sends us. I leave you with this blessing from John O'Donohue. You can hear him read it in that interview I mentioned earlier. Somehow it speaks, albeit obliquely, maybe through a glass darkly, to the coming of Jesus into the world, the trust we need, and the always ready for us redemption and new life he offers. On the day when the weight deadens on your shoulders and you stumble, may clay dance to balance you. And when your eyes freeze behind the gray window and the ghost of loss gets into you, may a flock of colors, indigo, red, green, and azure blue, come to awaken in you a meadow of delight. When the canvas frays in the curric of thought and a stain of ocean blackens beneath you, may there come across the waters a path of yellow moonlight to bring you safely home. May the nourishment of the earth be yours. May the clarity of the light be yours. May the fluency of the ocean be yours. May the protection of the ancestors be yours. And so may a slow wind work these words of love around you, an invisible cloak to mind your life. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.